So I'm here to talk about student privacy and big data. There's been a lot moving in this space in the past couple of years. It's really become a, a matter of wide public debate, uh, a lot of media attention, uh, and really corporations and schools are starting to pay more and more attention to what happens with the amount of data that they are collecting on students uh, in the short term and the long term. So first I want to say, what do I mean by student privacy? So I look at student privacy, or rather sort of data in educational spaces. I look at data that is in traditional educational spaces like schools and non-traditional educational environments like online learning platforms, apps, digital frameworks. Uh, I also want to say here that for me, student privacy is not a youth issue. There are obviously issues related to students being young, but that is not my focus. My focus is on data in learning environments and what about those environments uh, differentiates it from other environments and how might we need to treat, uh, create rules specific for educational spaces and the educational context. Even if you have nothing to do with schools, you should care about student privacy, not only because it will create the new citizens for the next generation, but also because it has tremendous ramifications uh, for the labor market as well. Schools create credentials. Credentials often determine what happens in the labor market. So there's a lot of uh, implications of what happens in terms of how data is used to both advance and judge students in educational environments. The, the cloud and big data have really advanced the conversation, and they're really what has prompted the uptick in interest in student privacy in the past several years. If you think of the paradigmatic flow of information in education, it's based on the idea of a physical classroom. And when I say flow, I mean collection, use, retention, basically information practices. We don't think of traditional classrooms as places where there is data, except for perhaps grades. But if you use an analogy to online, environments, there is data. There's a data exchange that goes on between students and educators, among themselves, and between both of them and institutions. So in the teaching process, students give off data through what they say, through their tone of voices, what they look like, their posture, their clothing, who they're standing with. Teachers absorb this data and make judgments on how to teach and change their behaviors accordingly. Uh, most of that data is not captured in any quantitative way or captured at all except beyond an impression by uh, an educator. Maybe they'll mark how many times someone participates in class. That's usually what's called formative assessment. It's diagnostic for the most part. What we tend to think of as data in the educational realm is what is summative data, essentially the end of semester grades. We often see that as things that are more we're more comfortable with the idea of those being shared. After all, grades are basically used as signaling and credentials for next for schools in the future, for employers. What's happened in the digital environment is that uh, the use of digital tools in the classroom or as supplemental to classroom activities has created a bi-directional flow of data. Uh, through this, People who are schools and education providers and the vendors that both use to help provide these services collect the same sort of data you would get on a commercial web site. Not only the content of student answers and responses, but clickstream data and metadata. And this is recorded in, in really significant contrast to the ephemerality of the data within a traditional uh, classroom setting. It means you can have much more granular data. You can all, with the cloud, it also creates permeability of networks. Uh, data within this traditional school environment is pretty contained within that immediate environment or to people who knew the student personally often. Now, it can be shared uh, at a moment's notice and not intentionally. Uh, in many cases, you know, as you're aware, it's not easy to determine what kind of information a particular app is using uh, in, and collecting from you as you're working on it. Uh, so, uh, and finally, you have big data, which enables uh, information to be collected from a variety of what were previously real silos in education. So the student information system that might have administrative data would store information that was separate from uh, perhaps academic information or information uh, about cafeteria records that might include what a student eats. Uh, 
Now, uh, big data permits, uh, you can data mine those, combine them, aggregate them, analyze them any which way you want. You can also pull from new sources, uh, non-traditional educational sources like social media. On, uh, at schools where there are campuses, you can use geolocation data from RFIDs. Uh, you can see what someone ate based on their billing records in the school cafeteria. And uh, all this wealth of information uh, allows a degree of analysis that previously hasn't really been possible in the educational spaces in contrast to more business spaces, which is why there is really a shock uh, to the system and a real sorting out of norms uh, that's happening in the educational system now. So that has called a bit of, caused a bit of an explosion. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, real parental concern and media, uh, sometimes hysteria, over what is occurring with, with data. On one hand, you have technologists and reformers who describe the amazing benefits that may be possible with student information, that we, we really just, to create uh, insights that couldn't be possible before. Insights about what helps students over time, uh, what are, uh, what non-academic factors might influence their success or retention? Where are there potential uh, inequalities in the system that we uh, have not really seen otherwise? You can compare across schools and across times, which really hasn't been possible at a scale before. There's also the potential to use this information to create learning apps that are often algorithm algorithmically driven or automated that help provide personalized learning systems for students which may be better tailored to their ways of learning, their progress pace, and really uh, prevent, provide ways that uh, both academically and, and beyond academics, you can't cater more towards specific needs uh, rather than broad generalizations. Uh, at the same time, you have uh, groups of parents in particular, but also advocates, uh, who are concerned about what are the unintended consequences of, of data. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit today, so please do not take that as my uh, lack of enthusiasm for uh, what is possible using this data, but often the hype of what is possible overshadows uh, other areas where I think we need to be thoughtful in how we implement these and develop them. So uh, parents uh, are off, a lot of the concern in the original privacy debate was conflation of educational policy issues and what I call information privacy issues. Educational policy issues, the way I see them are things like the common core. Uh, the concern about big data got wrapped up and student data got wrapped up with the common core since common core assessments are often very uh, data, data based. So, Many people use student privacy as their way to protest and perhaps block common core reforms. So a lot of the initial debate about student privacy was a real amalgam of issues uh, that came under one banner. Uh, as a result of that, uh, partially due to that, a uh, large Gates-funded project called In Bloom that was to be a interoperable data repository folded after, I think, le almost barely a year after its really triumphant launch. Uh, at South by Southwest EDU. I think it's in part because of the timing. I think it's in part because of it's the first time many parents and teachers realized how much data was being collected. And I think it's also due to the uh, in Bloom's lack of anticipation of, of the, the issues that would come up. They're really seeing it from a technologist's point of view, not really grounding it from the student or parental point of view. Uh, so the other issues that come up often are ideas about safety. So parents are normally upset about uh, the idea that their child's safety might be compromised, that predators will be able to find them using data, that security might be compromised through hackers being able to get into student systems. And, but what really uh, seems to get them the most, and what is, I think, the focus of most reform at the moment is uh, uses for data that doesn't, that do not, uh, or that may not prioritize the data subject's interest. To clarify on that, uh, there are several ways you can break this down. One would be if you have information that is used uh, in the immediate educational setting to benefit the student who's in the classroom. You can have data that's used for the broader benefit of the educational field. Uh, for learning science, for developing better policies. And then there's non-educational purposes, which may be used towards company profits, 
uh, public policy making in general. And I think there's uh, the tension between those different benefits and priorities are more stark when you come to data, and it often means choosing among perhaps countervailing priorities, which has created the tension around these issues. So a lot of the fear is about the evil capitalists, and much of the reform we're seeing reflects that. There's been a slew of reforms that have occurred in the past two years. There were eight federal uh, privacy bills introduced this year, and that's after pretty much none have been introduced uh, since uh, the uh, main one, FERPA, uh, was passed in 1974. Uh, there have been, I have the number, it changes by the day, by the way. Uh, so as of last year, there were 297 bills uh, introduced in 47 states. Uh, so there's really been a flurry of activity. And a lot of these are responding to stakeholder fears and many of them focus on how companies can use student information. A lot of those uh, rules focus on either uh, providing more opportunities for notice and choice for parents to consent to particular uses or collection, but, but often substantive restrictions on what companies can do in terms of using the data to collect it for uh, advertising profiles and for marketing. There seems to be a, uh, there's really become a, a vast consensus that that is deemed inappropriate. I'm not sure that actually reflects adequately most people's concerns, and I'm pretty certain it doesn't count for most of the things they're actually deeply concerned about when it comes to this data. I think it's a fairly easy issue to build consensus around, to say, oh, well, okay, no advertising. And I think it really uh, distracts from the more difficult issues that we will have to face when we're really talking about use of student data for educational purposes by educational actors in, edu in educational environments. And that's really where the you'll see uh, more big data concerns uh, start to play out in specific ways in the educational environment. So one of these that's uh, particularly concerned with the innovation environment is the surveillance effect. Um, whether it's the government or teachers or corporate entities, the surveillance effect is particularly important in education because there's the tendency to chill uh, intellectual exploration, create more conformist viewpoints, both of which at odds with our general ideas of what the purposes of we see uh, American education system to be. Uh, there's also um, the idea that you might be creating a permanent record. I think that's something I hear over and over and over, that the longevity of this information and its ability to move from place to place and be used in a decontextualized fashion people are afraid that that will somehow hurt students later in life. That uh, something your child does in, sef you know, in second grade could be used against them in college admissions or in an employment situation. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's one of the main fears of driving it. Uh, in, it, it, it comes out in various articulations, but I think that real idea of profiling and decontextualized decision making drives a lot of, a lot of the fears. Um, so FERPA is the primary federal privacy statute. I won't go into the state statutes, although many of them passed in the, in, in the past two years. Uh, it's just too complicated to do that, and the specifics are still evolving. Uh, but I want to explain why, wh what the baseline mechanism of privacy protection is in the US, and why it really isn't equipped to deal with big data concerns. FERPA was uh, enacted in 1974 and has been updated since then. It is a bill that conditions federal funding of educational institutions on, on compliance with several rules, the default of which is that schools need to obtain consent before they can disclose personally identifiable student information with outsiders. However, there are many exceptions which, uh, if not swallow the rule, take a big chunk out of it. Uh, the most notable of these for, for this audience would be the school official exception, which is how uh, schools share information with vendors and companies, so Google e email or uh, Class Dojo, and uh, a researcher ex and exceptions for researchers, uh, which are not really as much in the debate right now. 
although uh, fair warning, if you're a researcher, you should really pay attention to this issue because I think at least 30 of the current state bills uh, that, are, that are pending have provisions that may restrict the use of student data for research. Um, so one thing that uh, is about FERP is it really tries to control disclosure from schools to outside entities and make sure that's uh, used for uh, legitimate educational interests. It doesn't really suit today's world because first, it, cre it, it delegates a tremendous amount of responsibility to schools themselves. Aside from that limitation, schools have pretty much carte blanche to do whatever they want with uh, children's information. They don't have to get consent to collect. They don't have to get consent to use data how they wish. And how and it's very vague in terms of how they define what is a legitimate educational interest that is served by sharing information with outside parties. And this leaves parents and older students with a sense of really helplessness about their ability to control or even know what's happening with information schools collect about them. It's also difficult because it's, it's not a situation a, a situation where opt-out is generally a feasible alternative. Most, most people are not going to change the school they attend based on their privacy policies. It's not a luxury that most people have. And even people I've talked to who have tried to uh, not to use alternative ways to uh, have data or alternative devices or apps because they have particular privacy concerns Almost all of them have caved in because it was just too difficult for their child to have the same learning experience as their peers uh, in that situation. So the other thing that FERPA depends on, it's, it doesn't provide any uh, right guidelines about security about, uh, and, and about broader use uh, in, in commercial settings. It wasn't really created for a world in which data could be shared freely and uh, third parties who were not educational actors were became integral parts of day-to-day -day information flow. It was really created for an era of paper records when disclosure was a periodic and intentional thing. Where if, uh, it, to share student data, it basically required typically someone physically in a school to go to a file and hand it to someone or say something over the phone. Uh, that's a very different world than today where teachers using classroom apps may sh be sharing information that they have no idea that they're sharing and no, have not, no idea what they're doing with it, what's being done with it after they share it. So one of the reasons that we're seeing the student privacy debate rage right now is those built-in protections that FERPA was based on no longer apply and people don't have the same sense of reassurance that schools have, have this under control. There's also uh, an issue which is FERPA is, as I said, a statute that conditions federal funding on compliance. This means it does not apply to private entities. So unless you receive, well, it, 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 it does to sort of say large, uh, if you receive a certain amount of federal funding under, but essentially massive open online courses, learning apps, these are governed by the commercial regime, not the student privacy regime. So whatever protections FERPA does have, and having a special treatment for student privacy is a uh, class to be uh, protected uh, with, with uh, stronger, um, stronger guidance and rules, that is, those are not applicable in the private setting. So uh, I don't know anyone who's doing it, but conceivably uh, you could have Coursera selling information to insurers. Again, I don't think they're doing that, but you know, anything is technically possible under, under this, this realm as long as it doesn't uh, violate this, the privacy policies of the app. So. So I kept this slide in because I like it. Um, and it's, it's fitting right now. So I just went into some of the uh, things that the changes that have, have really prompted the debate right now and create ongoing concerns. One other thing to remember is that the advent of big data has created repurposability and value in records that before now were predominantly valuable only as a means of credentialing for students. So now you can have the student data that is used to improve products, to inf create advertising profiles, to create other predictive models. In general, it can be monetized point blank as something to sell or create value for a company. Uh, 
previously, you really couldn't extract that kind of data from student information, and it certainly wouldn't have been really much use to you if you didn't know the student it pertained to. Now, you can have a unique identifier or simply take that information and it will create value uh, beyond simply evaluating that student. Uh, as I said, there's really no consensus about reforms and what should be done. As I said, there is some, some, some force gathering in terms of marketing and advertising, but beyond that, there are vastly, wildly different conceptions of what the appropriate information flows are. Should we ban research? Should we ban any commercial use? Should we ban uh, product development? Should there be more permissions that are created around that? Uh, it's, it's a mess, pretty much. And it's very volatile at the moment. Uh, so, actually, so I've already gone into some of the distinguishing uh, characteristics of the education context that make uh, the concerns particularly palpable and make notice and choice, which is the default model uh, for a lot of these statutes and FERPA, really a very difficult one to create the level of protection or thoughtfulness about data flow that we might want in education. Uh, so, you'll all be familiar with, obviously, part of the problems that are caused by the use of big data, not just uh, an algorithmic decision making. This, this audience really is probably one I don't have to school in that. Um, but ones that I just want to point out and highlight is, there's not only the idea of inaccuracy and persistent labeling, but pigeonholing and pigeonholing, and uh, exacerbating existing biases. When you collapse formative and summative assessment in the way that digital tools do, especially adaptive tools, uh, depending on how rigorously you use that information, you may not allow enough of a flexibility or time lag, for, for example, for late bloomers to be able to catch up with their peers. So underserved students who may come into a semester and in our current system would be able to catch up by the end of the semester. If you have a deeply adaptive program that is based on granular assessments that happen over the course of the semester, you could see a future or a possibility of that student be diverted into a lesser path uh, prematurely in a way that have, would, might have disproportionate effects. So there's also the issue of self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, and I think also, particularly in this environment, transparency and accountability. I think those are really places where the conversation will have to go. Uh, right now, schools are not particularly transparent about what they do. Companies are not transparent about what they do. Very few people are transparent about what factors go into decision making. And there's very little way for parents or students to, to know what is increasingly determining their academic and employment opportunities. You know, in, in current school environment, parents can go up to teachers and say, why did my kid not get into honors class? There's someone there to talk to and perhaps challenge their viewpoint. That is lost when you have sort of a mass data system that might be run by an entity far, far away. <laughs> so that's something that I think will need to be built into the system, ways for transparency and accountability if we really want parents to trust the environment uh, for education. Uh, so Another system is, uh, that I'm increasingly becoming interested in is machine learning and how automated processes will factor into this equation. Uh, because uh, you have individualized students and in a way that is not like trading widgets, uh, it's important in the educational field to, uh, well, you don't want automated mechanisms to get ahead of themselves and create without enough sort of checks within the system per to prevent uh, rapidly escalating sort of issues from not being caught early enough. But another issue that I wanted to flag is, sorry, totally blanked, um, the idea of uh, how these tools might be used in terms of uh, later employment. Uh, at the moment, uh, credentialing People are proposing competency-based credentialing. So instead of a test at the end of the semester, you have uh, 
machine, essentially, analysis of skills. So uh, Newton, for example, is a company that is proposing creating a knowledge map for students. On one hand, competencies are fantastic. They eliminate lots of the problems people have with having a test that's given once, the pressure on that, and the pedagogical uh, consequences of that. On the other hand, it's very granular, and people may see it as invasive. Uh, it also runs the risk of, as I said, uh, creating distinctions that may not actually be useful later in a student's life or educational career, but that still remain as part of this data profile. Uh, one scenario that people bring up is if you have two students and one tested poorly on pattern recognition in eighth grade, and this somehow ends up being built in their profile that employers get to look at. Employers are generally risk adverse, and who are they going to choose if faced with a situation like that? They may choose two students who seem to be performing at equal levels at the moment, but uh, choose one that did not have, let's say, an aberration pattern recognition in a prior grade, simply because it seems like the safer bet. And the last thing uh, that I want to say, which is particularly important in this conversation, is a lot of this conversation is being held by policymakers and politicians. There's not, and, and parents, and there's, and advocacy groups, sorry, and, and people with educational agendas. There's actually not a lot of conversation with educators themselves. And I think that education is a place where it's particularly important to have educators weigh in on information practices. If you think about education as we currently conceive of it, it is essentially an exchange of information between students and educational resources, whether those be teachers or textbooks or uh, you know, digital books and courses. When you change information flow in terms of what is possible, so what information can be collected, what can decisions be based on, what information can even flow through the system, it's not like changing the rules that apply to purchasing a widget on Amazon. The widget will arrive from Amazon pretty much regardless of what you do in terms of that transaction, and it will still be a functional widget. When you change data flow, it's getting to the heart of what education is about, and uh, so, so to me, there needs to be mindfulness about the pedagogical effects of privacy policies, and so it, educators need to be roped into the conversation. And that's that. Yes. We're going to open up for questions. Does anybody okay. want to start us out? Oh. oh, look, they're reading 1984 in Mrs. Smith's English class. <laughs> it's funnier when you can read it, really. Yes. Thanks for summing everything up so neatly. Um, Ask me I'm, a messy question. I'm about to ask you a messy question. Um, what is to be done? <laughs> <laughs> what you know, is to I don't know. I mean, because um, I was talking to a company research re recently, and they're trying to help schools figure out which of these data collecting and analytical products to buy. And this company's amassed a database of nearly 4,000 different software products for schools, a chunk of which are learning apps th that claim to be personalized or analytic. Some of them are other kinds of uh, software systems that collect data and categorize students. Um, and given all these major issues you've brought up, what do you see as the way forward? So uh, first thing is I, I see uh, that there may be a role for regulation, but I think that most of the actual uh, reforms won't be at that level. I think regulation is too clunky. It's too slow. It doesn't keep up with advancing technology or advancing privacy norms. I think a lot of it's going to happen on the institutional level or uh, standard setting sort of uh, models. I think that, as you know, there's like the Future Privacy Forum has created a student privacy pledge that many companies have signed on to. I could see models like that evolving, but I think they will only work if they have su sufficient accountability measures built into those so that people are sure that whatever rules uh, consortia are determined to abide by, that they actually follow those. Uh, I think that uh, I think that there needs to be responsibility placed on vendors and collectors. 
I think that they are in a position to know what information is being collected and what is happening to it. And the current system forces schools to determine that for themselves. They have to determine whether the, uh, the vendor is using data inappropriately, when it's sharing it inappropriately, if they have adequate security in place. That's ridiculously difficult. It's not within schools' expertise, and it really drains resources. You know, if you had for things, these, this information coming from the vendors, uh, or app purveyors with some degree of certainty that it's actually truthful. I think that would go a long way. It, it would still have create a lot of decisions, but it would at least take the first part of the due diligence equation out. I think that especially if it would be helpful if there was a more standardized way to do this, so there were particular templates or formats or you know, uh, you know, computerized contract matching systems that didn't, that didn't mean that every school uh, administered had to be an expert in that. Uh, I can continue or go more. Uh, did that answer your question? Or, or did you, you looking for me to go further? Uh, I wonder if you would talk a little bit more about what you think the education technology industry could do. Because, you know, as you know, with the student privacy pledge, again, it's a prohibition on marketing use. It doesn't address the issues that you brought up about the educational use of educational data by educational actors in educational settings. So, uh, I think I think it's I think it's tricky. I think there there may have to be a I think there will have to be a development of ethical guidelines, uh, whether those are similar to sort of how we think of IRBs in in educational institutions in terms of looking at. Uh, data subjects and human research. This has obviously already come up in things like the Facebook Emotional Contagion Study, but I think it's going to be really important in education uh, because there's a, going to be a lot of A-B testing, there's going to be a lot of reuse of information, and uh, I think people have to develop clear principles for what is considered appropriate or not, or if that becomes too complex and we think that will change over time, I think there will have to be review mechanisms built into the process. I, I think that uh, the problem with that is, of course, that then you're dealing with problems after the fact. But if there's a review process built in that has some degree of public uh, accountability, that may be a way to do it. And also, you could imagine uh, the possibility of creating some sort of mechanism for due process and redress from harms, from particularly decision-making harms. However, as privacy people in the room know, it's very difficult to create a legally cognizable privacy harm. And that's particularly true when, as in here, we're often dealing with lost opportunities rather than actual uh, financial loss. But those are, those are ways I could see potentially moving forward. Um, and also, sorry, but particularly focusing on educational use, educational actors, or educationally approved actors, so that that other conversation is just a separate issue. Hi. Um, how much do you think the responsibility lies, though, in, um, in terms of regulating um, the effects of this? So uh, looking to employer laws and understanding what types of data can and can't be used in hiring decisions and discrimination um, to reduce the demand for this kind of data collection instead? I think that would be uh, a way forward. I think uh, there's some difficulties with, use, with uh, trying to have accountability for big data in employment situations. Uh, like Solon Rockus and Andrew Selps had a really good paper on that a while back. Uh, but I think it, it, it's promising. I think you may run into issues of First Amendment that might block it. Uh, but I certainly think that it will be important to look at uh, issues uh, when eligibility determinations are made, whether that's at the college admissions level or an employer level. I think that uh, that is sometimes where the rubber hits the road. Uh, yeah. Hi, um, I wanted to know what you tell parents and what they say because parents are going to, you mentioned in your um, lecture or, or talk that um, parents kind of resign because they want to have, they want their children to have the same um, experiences, but parents must say it's not enough, like we're not, because that's how they brought down in bloom. So what do you say to them? And I don't know, I, I'm, I'd like to 
ask more about um, data flows and information transfers. I think that's really interesting um, as it relates to machine learning. Um, I don't, there isn't really like a particular question, but I, I'd like to kind of, if you have more knowledge about in, information transfer and data, that, because it's, you're, we're basically gathering data about learners for years and years to come. Yeah. So, so one thing to say to that is, I think one of the big issues that, and I'm trying to focus on it too, is you know, there's a lot of discussion about like cross device, but but I think we're really also looking at cross context issues. So I think that uh, the sharing of information created in a school setting that has expectations about student privacy protections and what's an appropriate use in that setting being transferred seamlessly to say commercial entities or public entities. I think that's where a lot of the tension comes in. So I actually think that's a really great focal point for trying to get a handle on uh, places where there might be protections put into place or oversight. In terms of parents, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of really great practical advice for them. Unfortunately, I've seen a lot of people really have to cave in. One I see is don't approach your, don't approach schools as if they're trying, if, as if they're being irresponsible. It's particularly complex, and a lot of times they're just not aware, not because of any real negligence on their part, but just because it's a complex issue. So the parents I know who've approached their schools and saying, hmm, you know, you gave my child a Fitbit, and I'm not really sure how I feel about that. Let's discuss the ramifications of that. Seem to be more successful than ones come in screaming bloody murder. I just want to ask a, a follow-up question to that. Um, so those types of parents tend to be a little bit more knowledgeable right. and or privileged than the others. Um, so how does that divide work? I mean. I think that sure. like all of us have a little bit of a baseline knowledge about these things as to why if it might not be necessarily right. good. Uh, right. Uh, so, so one thing that I, I've seen, and and this is, this is anecdotal, but I will articulate it here, and sociologists will get mad at me. But uh, I've noticed that uh, there is a sense sometimes that the people who are most stridently opposed to data collection tend to be relatively privileged, uh, white middle upper class. Uh, parents, and and they're worried about, in some ways, what social stigma, stigma and whether the child will go to Harvard or lesser uni university be. What I've seen at, uh, sort of for underserved communities, is, is one of two different responses. One is just a general sense of, we're surveyed all the time, what the hell is different about this? Or, a deep suspicion of it in terms of that, or just sort of resignation. But on the other hand, I also see uh, several uh, people in our sort of community saying, we don't even have the resources to make these data collection issues an issue for us, because we don't have the technology to make this happen. And the other thing I hear is essentially, we have nothing to lose. This could help students tremendously, keep them in school, keep them on the right track, expose them to opportunities that they wouldn't have considered before, and any tools we can give them to do that, we may be, it may be worth taking those risks and seeing how they turn out. Uh, in the past, maybe permanent records, which you mentioned, were on paper, they were in the school basement, they would get flooded, eaten by rats, school burns down, they're, they're moldy, no one looks at them. What about this digital data, permanent, permanent record yeah. in the future? What about this data in 100 years? A company goes bankrupt, maybe someone else owns it, maybe digital right. corruption, maybe I don't know. Have you thought about this? Yes. So the bankruptcy case is actually very interesting because Connect EDU, an ed tech company, went bankrupt in the past year. And their student data was going to be sold off just as part of the corporate assets. And the FTC sort of stepped in to try to prevent that. But it, it just goes to show that when you're applying strictly commercial rules to student data, it creates a disjoint between what we often expect should be done and what is possible. In terms of the permanence of it, right? So I think that... Uh, one thing that I think is a possible solution is to have uh, stricter limits on retention or retention at a certain level of granularity. So after a certain period of time, uh, information about your third grade, the details of your third grade, uh, click stream, et cetera, data, the granularity, that will go away. And maybe you'll just have a couple of high points. Or maybe over time it will just end up being essentially what is the equivalent of a letter grade today. I think. Uh, of course, some of that information will be built into profiles and, and tools, but I think that having, uh, you can, st 
there's only so much of that information that is going to be useful later on for particular students. It may be useful in a research setting, in which case there are other structures in place that usually uh, create some ethical bounds, but I think that creating um, limitations on how long information at a particular level of detail can be held at various points along the system, or gaps in the sense that certain information we're not going to transfer from your elementary school to the next level. And maybe it will still be there for being available in, for other particular services, but we're only going to pass certain information on. We have, we have one quick follow-up question to that. Uh, I think that's a really interesting <coughs> proposal. However, if you look at the reality of the industry where most products are free and for a lot of ed tech startups, their primary asset is student data and hanging yes. on to it infinitely, how, how would you explain that to them? Hmm. Uh, you want me to solve the whole free data system? Okay. Um, give me a second. Uh, well, I actually think that uh, part of it is taking a longer term view. I, I mean, it's very easy for me to say. Um, and, it, and we still haven't solved this in the broader community, especially when we have public, uh, publicly traded companies that have fiduciary duties to their shareholders to maximize profits. But one thing I think is important, and it's particularly pertinent in education, is you can you know, sort of strip mine data and leave it for bare. But you're, you're burning, you're sort of burning bridges and scorching the earth, to mix many metaphors, as you go. If I think that one way to encourage uh, better behavior or is to convince companies that it is in their best interest to ensure that they have the trust of institutions, students, and parents. And I think one way to do that is to promote uh, not just like technical privacy policies, but policies that actually feel that actually address these real concerns. Um, I don't know how they'll go over, and I think some, some companies will be able to afford to do it more than others. Um, but I think that would be the way to go. You've framed a lot of uh, your talk in this space as a design problem as opposed to a problem for regulation to address. Okay. Um, in particular, your last point about, um, about um, how this the information flows changing could interrupt the pedagogical process mm -hmm. uh, in key ways and that's not a privacy issue especially the way we think of it in FERPA right because that's between the educator and you right. think educators should be more involved in this design process and so I'm curious are you aware of any good examples of technology companies collaborating with educators around these issues, solving some of these problems such that it's helping the pedagogical process. Because in my, my understanding is that most of those uh, technology platforms that are used for collecting student data are seeing the end users as the administration, right? This mm -hmm. top-down view mm -hmm. of we understand the tracking of all of our students, and it's not for the educators. So I'm curious, right. are you aware of examples where the um, educators are, are that end user? Well, so to address your first point, I suppose part of that is my definition of privacy, which isn't simply about confidentiality and security. I have a broader definition of policy that sort of more broadly encompasses the idea of how information flow affects contexts. Uh, so that, that is part of why I'm talking about it in that framing. But uh, I am not actually aware. So yes, you're correct. A lot of the issue is that ed tech companies are geared themselves towards the administrators. And that's part of why In Bloom ended up crashing. It's they, they didn't really consider... Uh, the individuals and the educators. Um, I do know of advocacy groups that are trying to create training for teachers, about, but that's more about literacy and essential good practices than actually pedagogical influences. There are some, no, no, not a lot. I mean, yeah. Um. I, I want to try to bring this down to a sort of more kind of tangible level. You mentioned uh, Google in yes. your talk. And uh, several institutions that I've taught at have basically signed these deals with Google where they dangle billion dollars of free stuff in front of them. And we all are now using Google Docs, Google Email, this and that. Um, I've always been curious as to what is the data flow behind those agreements, what, you know, have these schools signed away, perhaps? I, maybe they haven't. Um, does any of this data, what kinds of data go 
to Google, to Google partners? Um, what is the legitimate use? Are there any controls over that? Um, do you have any in insight into that particular relationship? So it's a very good question because uh, recently the Electronic Frontier Foundation filed a complaint uh, against Google Apps for Education uh, saying that they were violating the terms of the student privacy pledge uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, not much is known about that and their allegations uh, point out important issues, uh, but some of them are also based on capabilities rather than actual information about practices. Um, one of the main issues they have is that uh, they, they allege that uh, when students use Google Apps for Education services and then click outside those services to say YouTube, the policies change. So Google has said it will not collect information to use for advertising purposes within its educational platforms. The same rules don't apply in YouTube, uh, depending as formally, at least. Um, and Al Franken just wrote a letter saying to Google saying, we would like lots of information about what you do with students' information. But nobody knows, really. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of insight into that. Uh, for most companies, uh, they're very opaque. I think for public relations reasons and trade secret reasons, I think they just, uh, no, no, it's, it, unfortunately. I say I think often yes. I think that uh, higher education institutions are more sophisticated about it. Uh, they may have some limitations built into contracts, but about what further use can be made. But I think for the most part, it's a limited. It's it's. There's no actual let's say widespread cabining of what can happen with that information, as far as I'm aware. So there's an alternate view that privacy is a bad idea and the apparent problems that arise as a result of increased openness and memory of systems are the indication of other problems, perhaps with society, um, that are separate from a privacy discussion. Um, so I guess, do you think anything of that argument? Is it something that's flawed because of reliance too much on idealism? Is it human culture that's not capable of more openness? What do you think? I guess, sorry, I guess my question is what do you mean by privacy being open? Just it, that that could mean many oh, things so to my brain. I was, so. I was using openness to mean the opposite of privacy. So um, for the example of a, a second grader who got a bad score on something years later, if someone looks at it and makes a business or hiring decision as a result of that, um, you could argue that that's because the person doing that is a silly jerk and not that it's a problem to have that information be available. So I guess then I would distinguish between privacy, which I consider in some ways more, at least I'm talking about today, is much more of a bit of an in, uh, individual individual thing about what happens to data it, in that flow. And transparency, I think, is more systemic, right? That's more systemic idea of having a public idea, or at least sort of regulators, having awareness of what is happening in the system. So I guess you can have an awareness of what is happening in the system without necessarily revealing what everyone's specific paths are. Um, if, that, if that distinction helps out. Um, I do think though that in many ways when we get to big data, the complexity of the decision making and the factors that end up coming into that make transparency very difficult. It would be very difficult to, to determine that uh, employment decision was made based on that one factor. You know, it would be many other things, um, and that's both good and bad. Uh, so I don't think, I think transparency uh, can help. I think, you know, the sunlight is a good disinfectant, but I think that we also have to account for uh, the data-driven economy and, and counter to that. I don't think it can do it of itself, because you're, you're, you're basically saying transparency and then accountability for it. Those are two separate mechanisms, right? So if you just have the information about the employer making that decision, maybe nothing will be done about it. So you're really implying that either through social censure or, or some additional sort of mechanism that the company would be called into account. Alana, I want to ask you a question about, so one of the things you often say is that educational law is based on this paper transfer. I mean, isn't corporate law based on a tra paper transfer too? Why would one law be more 
prepared than another for, for sure. digital. So, so I agree. With, so you're correct, but I think there's something further. I think uh, FERPA, as I discussed, places a tremendous amount of discretion in, in educational institutions. They don't have to inform students or parents of what they're doing on any, in any level of detail. They don't have to justify or even define in any specific terms what they mean by a legitimate educational interest. Most uh, privacy policies of sophisticated institutions, including NYU, sorry, uh, say things like a legitimate educational interest is served when we share information if we've said that you should do something with the information, which is a very circular point of view. So what I think the difference is that there is some... In the, in, the, in the commercial environment, you have an a, assumption of antagonism. You have an assumption of not necessarily a zero-sum game, but opposed interests uh, often. So, you know, you want to sell me something for a higher price, I want to buy it for a lower price. That assumption is not in the educational system and in the foundation of sort of this law. In this law, it's presumed that if educators are using student information, they're using it for educational purposes. They're using it for educational purposes that benefit those particular students or the institution overall. And I don't think that assumption is built into um, the corporate model. Okay, so I wouldn't put the, and the agonism in the corporate model. What I would say is that trade has always depended on a flow of information between peers. Right. But I feel like there's a political economy story about a shift in the supply chain to education here that makes it so that there can even be a resort to corporate law. Like there's a leakiness between these two things in the lead up mm -hmm. that I wonder, because when you say that, that it's always been about information flow, I feel like you almost set up the problem for the corporate side to win. Ah, okay. Because I mean, if you look at, uh, let me go back 100 years just to make sure. the distinction clear. Like 19th century education, there's no, upflow from the student. It's right. authoritarian. It's, right. it's, a it's a socialization mechanism. So part of the transformation you're talking about is a transformation in the concepts of education itself, mm -hmm. which when it comes to data, you do ask questions about what this means. What does it mean to mm -hmm. measure a capacity or competence, these words, as opposed to measuring the transfer of a socialization, right. which if it's not complete, there's, there's a punishment. Well, so this may not directly just, but I, maybe it will get along the lines of thinking is, one thing I'm looking at is how uh, ed, your, people's view of the normative propriety of various information practices with student data often stems from their idea about the purpose of education and their, their paradigm for education, where they think education is about uh, creating economic prosperity and socioeconomic advancement, whether it's about creating democratic citizens and uh, a meritocratic system, you know, if it's about self-exploration. And I think that uh, often, those, the, whichever way you think of it, leads to you feeling that certain things are appropriate in about education data because of the ways it helps individual students and the broader effect on the efficiency of the educational system or what it game, aims toward. I also think that the way that data regimes are structured feed back into particular sort of paradigms. For example, as we move to a more quantitative based system where metrics are quantitative, there's incentive to do that because people want to measure progress. It, it, they want to be able to have information that's not mushy, to use the technical term. and by having that, uh, you then start measuring quantifiable aspects more as the learning outcomes to be desired. And that potentially skews the system away from less tangible outcomes that may be preferred under different models. So I think that's how the sort of idea of what education is about at least fits into the framework for me. Hi. Uh, so, um, one question is, um, what about the sealing of records? Um, so, uh, just as a solution to part of what you're saying, I mean, it strikes me that there's a similar issue with the permanence of records in the criminal justice system for juvenile records as there is in the type of records that you're talking about and similar solutions. Um, then for, uh, kind of disclosure that you're talking about and sort of the exchange that happens when you're making a contract, when you've got a vendor saying, here's this product, would you like to buy it? Um, and then, you know, what should be disclosed at that point? Part of my question is, do you have a good example 
of what the disclosure should be in any realm, in any digital realm. I want to see, I would love to know what a good example of disclosure of what the product is doing um, and what the data streams are, is. And second, um, what is, I mean, I just want to make the point that in that context, first of all, um, the customer there is going to be probably uh, a school district or someone from the administrator realm. So part of the what the answer to the question is going to be is going to come from the customer saying, here's what we need to know about, about yes. what your product does. And so what they need to know is, is different from what the educators need to know. And so when the educate, so it's so more of a problem of lack of educator agency in that transaction in general. And, you know, in fact, if, the edu if it's geared too much to toward what the educators care about, the administrators may not even buy the product. So you may actually ruin the deal. Um, so I just wanted to make that point kind of as a B-side to that. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think that this system isn't built to accommodate the uh, differences between district authority and educator authority. Uh, there's a lot of times that there's cla uh, teachers adopt uh, apps for classroom use. They don't have to run by districts because they're free. And it's very difficult for districts to track that. And some districts have explicit policies about whether those teachers can act essentially as agents that bind them into agreements. But it's very haphazard, and people are just starting to be able to grapple with that issue now. The other thing uh, you said is uh, in terms of whether there's a good model. Uh, I, I haven't seen any specifically used for that, but the information profiles that are used as part of some of these seals of approval in consortia, like co-regulatory regimes. I hate to mention COPPA, but like COPPA is a co-regulatory regime where there's essentially different systems where the FTC approves to it, that if you are part of this system, you're, you have the stamp of approval and, and a presumption, essentially, that you're doing things correctly. Uh, some advocacy groups have developed similar ones for student privacy. Uh, those are the places, people who conduct those evaluations that then lead to these seals being granted or not, those are the most comprehensive analysis I've seen. But those are costly and time intensive. And um, that's why I think sometimes having it come from the, the ed tech vendor themselves makes more sense instead of having sort of every school district do the same due diligence. And so I didn't know, what did you mean by the ceiling? Sorry. Uh, the ceiling of student records similar to criminal records? Oh, right. So, um, I mean, I think it's a very, it's a, a sort of the same impulse, right, that we think youth should be protected from their mistakes. I think that's something that's where retention comes into to play also. So I think sealing is possible, like sealing records is possible. I think it possibly is a good solution because it actually retains them for other uses. I think also, though, that the appetite for information, there will be a tension there that we'll have to resolve because I think that there's a lot of pressure and enthusiasm over trying to maximize the utility of those records. Um, Earhart and Martha have kind of stolen my question, but um, you, at the very beginning, you talked about assessment credentialing and implications for the labor market. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of part A of my question is, does that mean that your concern places you inside the view that education is for employment? and limit your ability to see those other perspectives. Ooh. And my second kind of question is, can we fold the labor market implications back on the teaching profession and ask, this is sort of the part that Earhart preempted me on, but ask what the practice of educating looks like as these tools come in and what the ethic of education should be in that mm -hmm. moment? Uh, I think you get to the very hard questions. First of all, while I incorporate the idea of the labor market into what I'm looking at, I do try to look at it from a variety of paradigms. I mention it partly because partly it's the most concrete. It's, it's easier for me to explain to people the consequences. I also think that one of the primary goals in our society is the use of education as a credentialing mechanism and, and for employment opportunities. And that's a lot of the art articulation of what the purpose is sort of in, in political rhetoric right now. It's, it's seen predominantly as a way for people to get opportunities in the labor market and a better fit between labor supply and demand. So 
yes, I think of that. I also think about the other things because um, I think it's important to have all of them. Other ways, the conversation becomes far too lopsided. Uh, then in terms of moving it back onto educators, I mean, in the end, I think that's where the real heart of it's going to lie, right? Uh, in the sense that what educational institutions decide to do with data, that's going to be, I mean, forgetting the rules and the regulations, whatever, like just the institutional decisions and philosophies and policies around data use, that's going to be what drives what happens with the data and what's possible as a result. I'm not sure that answered your question. Yeah, anyway. I guess um, the conviction from which the question comes is that it is administration and bureaucracy ah. that interfaces with data practices and it is education and learning which has a different ethic yes. that seems incommensurable to me. So I think um, you have, there's a negotiation there that I'm not sure ever, we, we ever really come out in a good place. I think, I think you're right. I think that you might see some of these issues play out in a more streamed line and direct to student, uh, student educator way in some of the independent learning platforms. So like Khan Academy, Coursera, edX, because they're direct to student, not that there isn't a bureaucracy, but I think that the questions of data use are more direct. So they may play out there. Yeah. Do you think that this is a de-skilling of teachers in the end? Hmm. Um, it depends who you believe in terms of how the future will turn out. I, I've, I have heard both predictions and I really don't know which is going to happen, whether this is going to, I think in some ways it is. I think in some ways it's a solution to we don't pay teachers enough and so we have big classrooms and maybe overwhelmed teachers. I think that's, that's part of what this is trying to solve through technology and more automated systems. Um, at the same time, there's an argument that this will free up teachers to do more individual interactions with students and focus less on the rote, conv conveying rote information and actual in helping in the problem solving. Can't, can't tell you that one. <laughs> Any other last minute questions? Okay. Um, you've talked a, um, a lot about um, a lot of the privacy issues coming to light within the transfer of context from educational institutions to commercial or other entities, but what about within the sort of closed system of the educational institution? Um, if you're not sharing that data with the outside yeah. other entities, what what concerns should they keep in the in, in mind yeah. when crafting their own internal privacy policies? So I think uh, some of the things I mentioned before would be. Uh, ensuring their ways to try to keep make sure the data is accurate, to make sure relevant information is used for a particular decision-making. Data minimization is, is a good tactic in the sense of only collecting information that uh, is going to drive services or insights and not just collecting it for the sake of collecting it. Uh, I do think transparency is important. I think having uh, places in the system where educators and potentially even you know students uh, and parents can see what's happening, why, what, what their data profile is, and what are determinative factors in, in certain decisions. I think that would be sort of very helpful. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of it is to consider how much benefit the actual student is getting from the data, like the student whose information is being collected, because I think it's very easy to collect information that benefits the institution long term or the system. And thinking about whether there are ways that uh, that affects st potential students negatively that you just might want to create a buffer for. I mean, one idea is really the idea of intellectual privacy and students needing some space to be able to create their own ideas, to have intellectual experimentation, to do some trial and error for non-linear learners, linear learners. Basically, a lot of that maybe, uh, students may be more hesitant to do that if they know that everything is being tracked. You know, there's actually been studies showing that surveillance not only has a chilling effect on, on communication and creativity, but also a conforming effect. So that students who knew they were under surveillance, who articulated their points of view, articulated viewpoints that were more aligned with what they thought the mainstream thought than actual their own point of view. And I think in education that's a particularly important issue because you want to have students exploring different ideas and playing devil's advocate. So I think that part of it is uh, paying attention to what is necessary and what's not, and creating a, as many safeguards and transparency as possible to make it feel like a safe system. 
Also, oh, sorry, also beware of scientism in the sense that I think that there's a tendency because these are objective for them to overrule teachers' instit intuitions and things like that. And I think in some cases, you can correct for bias using that. But in other cases, we have not developed a machinery that is as complex as the human mind and its ability to interact on an individual to individual basis. So I think that, you know, not shoving teachers' insights by the wayside. Not that you were doing that. I wasn't suggesting that. Thank you.